Well, hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we're covering the dates of January 17th through January 23rd, 2022. We're gonna start by saying farewell to the beautiful ring planet Saturn that is now setting in the Southwest just after sunset. Then we're gonna talk about the full moon that happens at the beginning of this week and discuss what it's called at this time of the year. We'll then highlight that great Pleiades star cluster that sits very high in the east after sunset. And then we're gonna celebrate the successful unfolding of the James Webb Space Telescope. So let's get to it. If you've been checking out the sky just after sunset lately, we can now finally say farewell to the beautiful ringed planet Saturn that now sits very low in the southwestern part of our sky. You can find it right here in Stellarium. And even though it's gotten a bit dimmer since late summer of last year because we've been getting farther away from the planet and it's been getting closer to the sun's glare, it's still been a great planet to check out in this area, especially if you have binoculars or a telescope to see Saturn and its beautiful rings and possibly a moon or two is always a treat. And when I show folks Saturn through a telescope, a lot of times people don't think it's real. They think I've placed a toy Saturn in front of the opening of the telescope. To see those rings with your own eyes is quite special. So we now can say farewell to this planet. It's been a great half a year, basically, where we've been able to see Saturn through late evening and now into the early evening. And now it will plunge into the sun's glare. We won't see it until later in the year when it reemerges in our morning sky. So of course, when we say farewell, especially to a planet, it's not forever, it's just for the time being. So if you do have a chance early this week and you look towards the west, southwest, just after sunset, maybe you can still catch a glimpse of the sixth planet from our sun, this beautiful gas planet, before it gets obscured by the sun's glare very soon. Now, right at the beginning of this week, on Monday, January 17th, we have the year's first full moon and of course this is when you see the entire disk of the moon and when the moon is opposite of the sun in the sky a lot of folks like to take advantage of watching the full moon rise and there you'll see that kind of orange glow around the moon because the moon is shining through more of the curvature of our atmosphere and the light is refracted a bit more than when the moon sits higher up so it creates a really pretty reddish orange moon to see especially when it's low in the horizon of course with the full moon this is when we have the most natural light in our night sky and when our tides are strongest. Our high tide is highest and our low tide is lowest since the combination of the moon and the sun's gravity are combined to really exert a tug on the earth, accentuating those tides. And for this particular full moon, the exact time of this phase is at 2350 universal time. For us here in the East Coast of the United States, local time, that's about 6.50 p.m. So that's convenient for us because we don't always get the exact time of full moon coinciding when it actually is rising out of the eastern part of our sky. Now, speaking of the sky that we're looking at, the full moon at this time of year is always situated by the constellations of Gemini and Cancer the Crab that we find there. Those are some prominent winter constellations that we can find in this area. Cancer is more of a spring constellation, but it's close enough. Gemini is technically part of the winter sky. And so you can see that the full moon is situated between those very famous constellations. Of course, two constellations that are part of the zodiac. And this particular full moon in January has an interesting name, at least to Native American tribes. It's known as the Full Wolf Moon, which I really love that name. And that is most likely due to the wolves that are commonly heard in this part of the world in the winter time that are howling for various reasons. And a great resource if you want to look at the phase of the moon and exactly what you're looking at and additional details, there's a great NASA resource on their Scientific Visualization Studio website, either called Dial a Moon or Moon Phase and Libration for a particular year where you can look at the moon in detail and look at a particular phase on a date and even time as well. So of course, this is the full moon where we can see the entire disk of the moon here and the time set to the 17th here at about the time of exact full moon. You get all these interesting details down here of what you're looking at and the diameter of this and the distance from Earth and all that great stuff. And also as we look down here, I'll give you some videos and some animations that show the phases throughout the year and the interesting surface locations that you can check out 
on the moon as well, especially at lesser phases than full. You can really get a good idea of what you're looking at along the Terminator, along the day night side of the moon. But anyway, it's always nice to kind of take a look at the exact phase of the moon in detail. And hopefully you can celebrate the actual full moon in the sky on the 17th, our full wolf moon, the first full moon of 2022. It's certainly always great to celebrate Earth's natural satellite. At this time of the year, if you're looking very high in the east in our evening sky, you may have a chance or may have already seen a tight bunching of stars, stars that are real close to each other. And that is of the Pleiades star cluster that we find right in this area here. Now this cluster, as we zoom into a little bit more, is commonly considered the Little Dipper. That is something I used to believe too when I was younger, and it does look like an ultra tiny spoon-like shape in the sky. But the actual Little Dipper, the one that most people recognize as a Little Dipper, is in the northern part of the sky. You find it right here, and it's actually part of Ursa Minor, which is the small bear constellation. So this little dipper we find here, and there you find the tail, and at the end of the tail or end of the handle of the little dipper is the North Star Polaris. So the little dipper is a little bit bigger in area compared to the cluster that's commonly or mistakenly called the little dipper, but in reality we call it Pleiades, or sometimes you hear it known as the Seven Sisters right there. We'll actually highlight it here in Stellarium just to hone in on it here. This cluster is also famous not only because it's noticeable in the sky, because it's part of the famous winter constellation of Taurus the Bull. Pleiades actually lies on the back of this. Of course, Taurus is also one of the signs of the zodiac. So along the back, we find the Pleiades star cluster right there. And this cluster is so famous. It is recognized all around the world. These stars really are noticeable. They are bright. And it's amazing to know that most cultures, societies, countries have some type of story, mythology, even religious beliefs tied to this grouping of stars. Of course, here in the United States, we connect with Western astronomy, and usually we go to Greek mythology when we talk about this cluster. From that time period, it's been known as the Pleiades star cluster, but again, you also hear it known as the Seven Sisters because long ago, people saw primarily seven stars with their naked eyes. And you can today, but you need a really dark sky and very good eyesight. Most folks, including myself, only see about six stars. But the seven sisters from Greek mythology are the daughters of the famous Titan known as Atlas. And you've probably seen depictions of Atlas or know who he is. He's that figure that holds the skies above his head or a globe, typically. He was a Titan that fought the Olympians, the main gods from Greek mythology. And him and other Titans were actually defeated. And since he was defeated, he was punished forever. His punishment was to carry the burden of the skies on his shoulders. So a lot of times in artwork or sculptures, you see this figure, Atlas, holding a globe. And that's actually supposed to be him holding a celestial sphere and not the Earth. And the reason why we think he's holding Earth is because the word Atlas now means a map. It's tied to a name that was associated with maps first in the 16th century. But anyway, Atlas was the father of these daughters. He actually had many other daughters, including a grouping of stars known as the Hyades star cluster that sits near Pleiades. Hyades is actually the V or the nose of Taurus the bull. So that is another group of daughters or sisters that lie there. So they are actually half siblings to the Pleiades or the seven sisters we find right here. But that's from Greek mythology. Of course, there are many other stories around the world. You find stories from Asia and the Middle East and Africa, North and South America, and various islands in the Pacific as well. In Hawaii, for a long time, this has been famously known as Makali'i, and in their traditions, the rising of Makali'i, or this star cluster, in the evening sky, especially in November and December, marked the new year for them. So the old Hawaiian calendar actually began in around the November-December time frame, marking the rise of this cluster of stars. If you go to the Aztecs in Mexico and Central America, the helical rising of this cluster, which is the rising in the early morning before the sun, marked the beginning of the year, and that was around May and June in the early summer. So that marked the beginning of their calendar, watching this cluster rise. 
In the central plains of North America, we have the Pawnee tribe that were very well-known observers of the stars, and this cluster was also quite important in their storytelling. And interestingly, they represented the stars as brothers instead of sisters. If we move over to Asia, in Japan, this cluster is famously known as Subaru. And I know many of you probably know that name, of course, the car company with the same name. In Japan, Subaru means unity or coming together. And if you look on the logo of Subaru cars, you see this star cluster. And when you look at that logo carefully, you'll see six stars. The five dimmer ones represent older companies that eventually came together to form one larger company, which became the Subaru Corporation. That's represented by the bright sixth star you see in the logo. So it's interesting you find this cluster on the logo of cars. Maybe you drive one of these vehicles as well. And not only are the traditions and the observations of this cluster important, but even for famous storytellers and poets, like the Greek poets of Hesiod and Homer, who incorporate this cluster, in their famous stories, and in religion as well. The Bible, the Talmud, and the Quran incorporate the cluster on a few different occasions in various religious texts. So as you can clearly see, this cluster holds a lot of importance to many different people around the world, most likely due to this star cluster being very bright, noticeable, and you can see it from almost any location on Earth as well. Now, if we really want to understand this cluster a bit more, let's continue to zoom in to get a better idea of what we find here. Now, with your naked eyes, you can see about six or seven stars. But even though we go by the name the Seven Sisters at times, the main stars you probably are seeing are probably five or six of the sisters and their father, Atlas, not all seven of the sisters themselves. So we can actually click on individual stars and the brightest ones have names. We'll go to the brightest of the cluster, and that's this one right here, which is called Alcyone. And we'll continue on here. We'll move to this star here, which is Merope. Then up above that, we have Electra. Then this star here, which is also fairly bright, that's Maya. Above that, we can go to Taijeta. We'll move over here to the right to Seleno. And the other bright one that's kind of on the other side of the cluster down below is their father, Atlas, that we find here. And there are other noticeable stars if you're in a very dark location that you can see with your naked eyes. The mother of all these daughters, Pleione, which has its roots in the name Pleiades. And that name Pleiades has connections to the ancient Greek word plane, which means to sail, because at the sailing time of the year, when this star cluster rose in the morning, in the summertime, that would be the sailing season in the Mediterranean. So that's where we think the name Pleiades comes from. And then we move above that to some other stars that are fairly bright, but maybe not noticeable to your naked eyes. And that's this star here called Sterope. And there's another star that is very close to it, but just a little bit dimmer, and that's Sterope 2. So there's Sterope 1 and 2, but the main sister that's usually included is just Sterope, which is this star right there. So that kind of connects the brightest stars you find in the cluster you don't find all of the sisters with your naked eyes. You might be seeing their father, Atlas. But as you can see here in Stellarium, there is much more than those stars I've clicked on there. You can find hundreds, if not thousands of stars. And you can see all that from beautiful pictures by astrophotographers and really large observatories around the world, where you find some amazing detail among the bright stars and other stars inside the cluster. The main bright stars are blue B-type stars, which are very hot and a bit younger. They're about 100 million years old, all born out of the same gas and dust in the same area of the sky. And over the next 250 million years, they're actually gonna slowly disperse and move away due to the gravitational influence from outside the cluster. And what's really noticeable, especially through those really nice pictures, is the bluish gas and dust you actually see right in front of the stars. And at one point, we thought that that dust were the original ingredients for the prime stars of Pleiades, but it turns out it just may be coincidental dust that's in between us and the stars, and the star's light is reflecting off the dust. So this would be considered a reflection nebula, and dust in space likes to reflect light back in the color blue. So that can tell you there's a lot of dusty material in that area around those stars there. And over time, like I was saying, these stars will slowly disperse over about 250 million years and will no longer be together in the sky. But of course, for now, they look beautiful as this really nice open cluster. And it's one of the closest clusters to us at about 444 
light years away. That is still far in terms of distances that we relate to, but 444 years is a relative neighbor of ours for deep sky objects like this. So as a neighbor of ours, as a beautiful grouping of stars that either we call Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, or all the other names you may use, Subaru, Makali'i, or anything else you find around the world, it's an absolutely amazing group that you can find in the sky right now, high in the east along the back of Taurus the Bull. So hopefully you'll have a chance to find Pleiades sometime soon. And finally, I wanna briefly celebrate the successful deployment and unfolding of the James Webb Space Telescope that was recently announced to happen successfully this past January 8th, which is really, really exciting. James Webb, as we mentioned in our December 20th through December 26th, 2021 episode, where we featured this space telescope, this is the next great space-based observatory. It's considered the successor and a complement to the Hubble Space Telescope, and is about 100 times more powerful than Hubble. And what it is, is an infrared telescope with a very large light gathering area that's more than 21 feet in diameter. That is going to allow it to see farther into the universe, further back in time. We're gonna see galaxies that were formed not long after the Big Bang. We're gonna look at atmospheres of exoplanets, maybe detect molecules that show that there's a presence of life on those exoplanets. We're gonna be looking at the stages of stellar birth and death through nebula and all those kinds of objects throughout our galaxy. And also look at objects within our solar system as well. So we're gonna learn a lot from this new space-based observatory from the JWST. And the unfolding process and the launch process was a very, very scary time. This, of course, was launched from French Guiana on an Ariane 5 rocket this past December 25th on Christmas. The launch went very successfully and smoothly. And then right after, the deployment process would happen. That was the scary, nerve-wracking part where the solar panels had to be deployed. And the really scary part was the deployment of the solar shield here. This five-layered solar shield, which is very delicate, that protects it from the heat of the sun, from the heat of the earth and the moon, that was deployed in several different sequences and that happened successfully. And then some of the instruments had to be moved in various places. And then the mirror segments, the secondary mirror and the primary mirror had to be kind of unfolded in various ways. That all occurred nicely. And now this is on the cruise stage as it makes its way to L2. That's a million miles from the earth in this sort of gravitational kind of dead zone, if you will. And from there, it can always face away from the Earth, Sun, and Moon as it looks at the universe. It has to be very, very cold. So from now on, it is cooling down. And over the next four or five months, scientists and engineers on the ground are going to be calibrating the telescope. They're going to be focusing it, making sure everything is working before they start taking images of the universe. So we are on the eve of some great discovery, some great observations by a new space-based observatory. And this is not hyperbole to say this may be one of the greatest scientific instruments ever devised by humankind. It's a long process, a 20-year development from technicians, engineers, scientists from all around the world. So we really have to congratulate NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency and the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Space Telescope Science Institute where all of this has occurred. And that's really exciting. And also the Ariane 5 rocket and ESA because they launched it so precisely that they enabled this space telescope to possibly operate for 20 years. It has fuel that has to keep it in the stable place. And if the launch didn't happen perfectly, they would have had to use some of the fuel on board to get it in the right spot. So they originally thought they'd have 10 years with this. And now it looks like they'll have at least 20 years of fuel to operate this in L2. Uh, away from the Earth. So that's really, really exciting. So stay tuned for images later, maybe the second half of 2022 from James Webb as it peers deep into the universe and further back in time. So go JWST. Well, there's another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And we hope to see you back here in Daytona Beach at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in person at some point. And of course, at the Loman Planetarium. We are running shows every day and we're doing so safely. So come check us out for a show. And if you want any more information about those programs, please check on our website online. So with that, we hope to see you back here again soon. Take care. And of course, 
happy stargazing.